So to recap from last meeting, we talked about characters, and I talked about the character joint hierarchy and how it relates to the scene graph hierarchy. And they are both hierarchies, but they are different, uh, not necessarily related in any way, and that tends to confuse people, so it's worth recapping that a little bit. Um, in the scene graph, which has rectangular nodes, as we all know, uh, we have a character. It's the top node of a character class, and it typically has one or more geom nodes. And that's all it has, typically. Um, but it may have some other nodes if you expose a joint or two. So you may expose a node called joint A, and you may expose another joint, maybe it's joint B, I don't know. So this is what you see in the character hierarchy if you do an LS in the scene graph. Um, uh, and you, actually, you might have some geom nodes under here, too, but you may not. Okay. But inside the character node, the node itself, it actually stores a pointer to a uh, um, part bundle. And the part bundle has its own hierarchy internally. So inside there, it's not only round, but it's also red. There's a part bundle. And that's the root of the character joint hierarchy. And this has the full joint structure under here. So down here we may have joint A, again, the actual joint, and maybe a joint B is over here. And we've got some other silly names down here, D, E. Every joint has a name, and no two joints can have the same name. Can you query that and list it? Yes, you can. Uh, you can get the part bundle node, which is character dot get bundle, and so if you if you actually have a node path to the character, which you what you typically will have, then you have to say node path dot node dot get bundle to get your part bundle, because node path dot node gets you the actual character node, and get bundle is a method on the uh, character node. Um, at the same time, when you load an animation, which is something that you might play in a character. Typically, you don't store the animations in the scene graph, but if you did, it would look like this. It would be an anim bundle node. And that's all you get. That's, this is your animation table. This is like Mickey Walk, the walk animations. Uh, so this is, this is really just a table of data for Mickey's walking animation, every joint, every frame, yeah. that data. And it, <coughs> again, you can get to the node and call get bundle this, and this gives you an anim bundle, which I'm running on room for, but it would look like this. Where is the anim bundle node store? It's in the data graph. This will be if you call loader.loadmodelmickeywalk.egg, uh, then you get an anim bundle node. And this is how the, all the characters actually load the animation. You load the walk animation, which is just an egg file after all, uh, you get an anim bundle node. Um, actually, you might have to find it because I think the top node might be the model node. Um, you get the anim bundle node, and inside the anim bundle node, there's a pointer to the actual anim bundle itself. And the actual anim bundle is the root of another hierarchy which happens to match exactly the structure of the character hierarchy. Like that. And matches exactly physically and also name for name. Um, the, uh, the only reason you collapsed on the scene graph is for efficiency? Yeah, the scene graph is collapsed for efficiency reasons because really we don't need to have all this stuff for, uh, for rendering. This is the only purpose for the joint hierarchy is to calculate where the okay. vertices go each frame. So when the character plays, um, well, actually, let me take a step back. When you bind the animation, uh, if you just let it write the character by itself, of course, it doesn't do anything until you bind the animation. When you bind this animation to that uh, character, and there's a method on part bundle that's called bind anim, it does that. You give it the anim bundle and the part bundle, and it returns you an anim control. And your anim control object is again something that doesn't live in the scene graph, but it has an association between the part bundle and the anim bundle. And in fact, it associates every joint one to one with this corresponding table in the anim bundle. Um, and now you can call play on the anim, anim control, and that tells the character to start cycling through all the animations in the anim bundle. Now yes. The part bundle and the anim bundle, do the name have to be the same, like the group name or whatever? Yes. Mickey or Mickey. Yes. Or these names generally have to be the same. Uh, and that's 
Uh, that's by design so that you don't accidentally play the toaster animation on the Mickey model. Which would you say the same is the same like the joint name or the root node name? Uh, the say root node example. also needs to be the same as well as the joint name. But right now, if you try PVU on, uh, say, Mickey 1200 model and a Mickey walk, the names are not the same, but they play fine. Like yeah. the top, top names, like, uh, is it the bundle name? Or uh, the ma it may be that the node... I mean, they have the Mickey prefix, but after Mickey, they have, like, different things. It may be that the node name is different, but the Adam bundle itself has to be the same. I'm pretty sure that it is the same. Otherwise, PV will play it because PV does a matchup by name. Okay. Um, now it is true you can, if you really want to force it, you can force it to bind animations with, without regard to name. Uh, and just trust me, I know that these are the same animations, even though the names are different. Okay. But you don't. You have to go out of your way to do that. PV doesn't. Uh, so if you're if you're successfully playing animations, I'm pretty sure the names are the same somewhere. So that and means like I must be confused about the name part then, because I see like two different parts, like it starts from Brook and then all the joint names are the same. Yeah, that's... But at level above that... Uh, yeah, the, where the name comes from is a is a <coughs> point of confusion too, that the name of the root group. And uh, it looks different in the anim file as it does in the model file, and if you're looking at the egg files. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure off the top of my head which name it uses, but we can answer that empirically. Okay. Um, but at some level, one of the, one of the functions to soft to egg is uh, give me the name, specify the name of this animation. And there's a, I know being specified to be the same. And that applies to both the part bundle and the anim bundle. Uh, but note that um, although there is a loose correlation here between joint B and joint B here, and between joint A and joint A here, there's not a tight correlation in the scene graph and the joint hierarchy. So you can really technically do whatever you like to these nodes. It really has nothing to do with what the character is doing, which is living in the same separate world. Um, and that's often also a point of confusion sometimes. And also... Wait, what do you mean by that? You can do I mean, you can reparent this joint. Yeah. Um, you can create another node in the middle, <laughs> parent the joint to that. Um, you can actually remove the node altogether. The character still plays. So the animation is just setting the local uh, transforms for each of the... Right. The components of the character. Yes, when a joint is exposed, it means the character, the, the joint uh, knows a relationship to this particular node, and it knows that every time it updates, it's going to set a local transform on this node. Is that similar to the physics system? The yeah. Accurate physics? Yeah, it's similar to that. Except in the case of a physics system, it's a special kind of node that's inheriting from a physics system. In this case, it's just a regular node. Um, the character just happens to have this, this permanent binding, well, a temporary bind, at least, to this particular node. You can, break, you can actually sever this bind, too. You can find the character, find this joint, and say, don't an update that node anymore if you wanted to. Um, and if you want to, at runtime, you can create some more nodes and expose some more nodes at runtime. Normally, we expose a node using the egg opchar program, which you just say, uh, one of the options is dash expose, and you list all the joints that you want to expose. And that puts a DCS flag in the egg file, so that when the egg file is loaded, the joint is already there for you. you but can, at runtime, you can? At runtime, you can expose them, too. <laughs> yeah, right. In fact, there's a method on actor that will do that. Um, we also talked last week about how the actor encapsulates all this logic uh, in a relatively high-level interface. And if you just call actor.expose joint, it does all the rangy stuff it needs to do to create a joint for you and expose it. Um, so then once it's exposed, then I could attach other geometry. Yes, you can attach geometry that you like, and that geometry will animate along with the joint. Um, there's an inverse relationship, which we only just added. I uh, added this for two reasons. One, because Samir was trying to do this sort of thing with the Goonie. We have a little robot that um, has its own animation, and Samir wanted to be able to swing the head around in certain cases, which is adding a new animation to the character that didn't exist. Now, as it happens with the Goonie, we got a hack where we uh, managed to work around this by just taking the joint, as I suggested here, and reprinting to another note as I drew. And so Samira can bang this node around, and still the joint animates underneath that node. So that still works for the Goonie. But um, it'd be nice to have a more elegant solution. Also, the guys at CMU were asking about this, because they had a different call, where they had some motion capture puppet, and they wanted to animate some joints, but uh, directly control some other joints. In that case, they had a soft skin character, with vertices that crossed between the different joints, unlike our own little robot. Um, so you really need to have direct control over this joint in order to do that. Um, so now we have a new relationship, which was always on the list to, to add. I just never got around to it. And that's called a control joint, where uh, you can 
have the joint read its animation from a uh, node position every frame. And actually, the relationship is not really in this direction. Uh, it's a little more circuitous than that. Actually, it goes like this, whichever joint A is. It goes from here to here. So the way it works is, you take your anim bundle, and you find a particular animation node in the anim bundle, and say, OK, this animation, instead of using the table that you loaded up from disk, you're going to get your animation from this joint position. And then when you bind that anim bundle to the, to the character, to the part bundle, then this joint, which really is just every frame querying the anim bundle for its animation, now it ends up querying this, this joint directly instead. And you can still go back and forth between You can bind a different animation. Uh, so it, uh, if you want to turn on, basically if you say, I want to control this joint, you're turning off the animation for that joint. Yeah. You want to control it, you're replacing that animation. So you can create your own animation uh, that has, it's all the same as existing animation, except your one particular joint is being controlled. If you want to toggle back and forth, you can load that animation up twice. You can't blend between the two? Yeah, sure, you can load that two animations. You can, um, you can have a Two totally two identical copies of the anim tree, uh, one of which is replaced with your own control joint, and then you can blend between those two animations, so that would achieve that effect. Okay. Um, but there is again, there's an interface on Actor also called Control Joint, where you just say Actor dot Control Joint, and it gives you a node that you can now control the joint with. I'm just thinking in terms of like stitch, stitch kind of characters. <coughs> Right, so a stitch would be a fine example of this sort of thing. And it may be that you have certain joints on stitch that you always want to control, and that's what active control joint is good at. Um, if you want to do something fancy where you have a, 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 um, a joint that you sometimes control and sometimes it's controlled by animation, yeah. um, then uh, you have to do some fancy blending. But probably what you really want is to always control a particular joint. And what, in fact, what you might uh, commonly do is uh, create a new joint just for the purpose of controlling that maybe is a parent of the joint that's already being animated. That way you don't have to replace any existing animation. Um, and uh, egg optera is also very good at creating new joints. Egg optera dash new creates any new joints you like. So egg optera is worth pointing out too. That's a separate program that process, pre-processes an egg file uh, and all of its animations. A bit of a, a tangent here, but uh, let me bring it up. Um, you can reparent joints as you like. You can move this hierarchy around wherever you want it. Um, it, it, uh, by default, the behavior of egg optera is to notice which joints aren't really necessary because they're either not moving or there's no geometry there. It can remove those. It can just, um, basically, if it decides that this joint isn't necessary, it takes this joint and parents it directly to the root. Um, so it saves some uh, uh, CPU runtime overhead. Um, you can create new joints where you want them uh, and all sorts of fancy stuff. Those corresponding part in the part bundle. Is yes. Egg Opchar automatically works on all the animations and the character at the same time. Okay. So it guarantees that everything is kept in sync. In fact, that's necessary. When you run Egg Opchar in default mode, you load up the character model and all the animations. It looks at all the animations, figures out all the uh, uh, positions of every joint uh, across all time. And that's how it decides which joints are actually animating and which aren't. Frequently, an artist will create a bunch of joints just for structural convenience that aren't actually being used. Um, so egg optera can detect those and remove them. Typically, it removes uh, 20 to 50 percent of all the joints. So. Okay. Um, let's see. That was just a recap. <laughs> <laughs> um, any questions so far? Does that make a lot of sense? So, what 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 would the actual panel be of just leaving the scene graph hierarchy? keeping all the joints exposed. And well, it's not so bad nowadays because the scene graph is a lot cheaper than it used to be. Um, but there used to be a very high per DCS overhead. Um, but if your character is totally hard-skinned, where all the vertices and all the polygons are completely assigned to one joint or yeah. another, um, then it probably will be similar the, at the end of the day. Um, similar overhead to having a, a joint hierarchy that exactly mirrors your apartment hierarchy, and that's possible. Um, the savings comes about when your character is soft-skinned, because in the case of a soft-skinned joint, suppose you have a polygon whose vertices are partly, partly in this joint and partly in this joint. Mm -hmm. um, now, where is that going to be? Where is that polygon going to appear in the scene graph, right? I can't, 
I can't have it under this joint altogether. I can't have it under this joint altogether, and I can't have a node falling on node that straddles both joints. If I do, if this is really an instance, then that means the geometry is duplicated. It doesn't mean that it's somehow sharing uh, some property. So uh, you, you can't really define what transform space it is. You have to pick one or the other. Um, and the character node, by default, picks neither and puts it under here, and then calculates the vertices completely on its own and just updates the vertices. Um, there was an old so so something that's under a joint that's exposed. Right. The geometry may not actually. <laughs> Be under that. Uh, right. So that's that's a good point. So when you expose a joint, it doesn't necessarily create the geometry under here. Uh, it will, because that's optimal if the geometry happens to be hard skinned. So if you go egg op cherry dash expose pick a joint A, um, and it happens to be some hard skinned geometry in joint A, it will put it here. Mm -hmm. And now this is no longer dynamic geometry; it's just fixed geometry, just like anything else. Mm -hmm. And it knows that when this joint animates, it's going to animate that, and we're happy. If you did not expose joint A then the geometry here would end up being here, and it would just be animated directly with the vertices. Um, now, uh, so then if you, if you were to externally bang on that joint, it wouldn't affect the geometry associated with that. Uh, now, right. if, if all the geometry in joint A were hard scanned, it would all show up here, and then banging on this joint would also affect the, the vertices. Okay. But you have to be careful banging on this joint, because the character's going to bang on it, too. Yeah. I wouldn't advise banging on it. But if you, if you if do the... External control yeah. kind of thing. That's right. If, if, uh, if you did the external control where we did the trick with the uh, greedy robot where you create an internal node in between, yeah. uh, this works on the head of the robot because the head is inheriting from this node and it's all hard skinned head. Hard skin. um, but if it was soft skinned, then. If some of their vertices were soft skinned, then at least those soft skinned polygons would end up here. Now, is, is that just for efficiency in terms of the calculations of where the vertices should be, or do you have to do that? Well, if the vertices are soft skinned, there's no there's no one place to put them. Okay. So any place is as good, good as anywhere else. It, the character decides to put them up here for convenience. Uh, also, it helps to reduce confusion. You know that if something ends up in your joint, you know that's hard skinned. Um, if if you did insist on putting the soft skin geometry down here, that means the character would have to compute all the vertices where they belong in relation to this joint. Right. Which is a little different from computing where they belong in relation to the character. Yes. Uh, so it's already. So it, it would be a little less efficient. Uh, not in or principle, because it's the same lot. sort of calculation, but it's already got the code that does this calculation, and it'd have to have more code to handle either case. Okay. So what happens if you set a uh, some other kind of transform, like a color change, on an exposed joint, and there's soft skin geometry in it? Uh, okay. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you're just playing playing the devil in the. Uh, <laughs> Well, if you do a color scale, uh -huh. that's not a problem at all. Okay. In fact, scene rec color uh, will always override uh, according to norm normal scene rec rules. So color scale applies downward onto the character. Yeah. Uh, color override on the scene graph also applies downward onto the character, mm -hmm. just like any other scene graph operation. The color in the character is stored in the vertices. Um, and you can, in fact, the character can specify that the color should animate. That's part of this character specification. Um, but in that case, that's all just stored in the vertices. If you applied a color override up in the character level on the scene graph, it would replace whatever color is being animated by the character. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we do that in Toontown, of course, where tunes change color all the time. But if I do a color override on joint A, any soft skin geometry that was associated with joint A is now actually under that other gem node. And that's true. Color override wouldn't. That's true, but remember, soft skin geometry, which is associated with joint A, by definition, isn't entirely associated with joint A. So it's not clear what color you meant it to be, anyway. <laughs> you should take the percentage of yeah, the right. <laughs> <laughs> change the color for that percentage. <laughs> the <coughs> what Samir did, like the Goonies, are they like soft skin or hard skin? No, they're almost entirely hard skin, uh, except for some of the bit around the feet where the joints are actually moving. But the head is particularly hard skin because it's a robot. So that makes it a little pretty easier. But nowadays, now that we have the new exposed flag, you don't have to do it this way. We could uh, actually grab the head and make an exposed joint, and then you can just, right now, Samir will have to bang on two joints, because there are actually two different nodes we had to do. We can just conveniently make one node now. Uh, we don't have to go this looking around. Um, and there, there actually isn't right now, but there will be as soon as I get a spare moment to write it, uh, egg op char dash expose, or no, egg op char dash control, to basically do the same thing as exposed does for the joints, so that all through the model pipeline we specify, here's a joint that we intend to control at, at runtime. 
What, what's the argument you give to control joints after that control joints? You, you give it the name of the node? Uh, actor dot control joint. Yeah, you give it the name of the node, okay. or the name of the joint. Okay. Uh, actually, actor because actor has a bunch of other interfaces that it needs. It needs the model root, which typically is going to be for model root, right. um, and it needs the LOD name, which might be I think MP string or none or zero or something like that for the, or maybe just quote LOD, because actor supports having multiple characters and multiple LODs. But ultimately, you give it the joint name, and it will give you back a node, or you can give it a node if you want. So um, yeah, how does that work for LOD nodes then? So if you say control this joint and it's in, does that control whatever is visible of all different LODs? Is that uh, you specify which one? A good question. I'd have to work that out. Exactly what happens with the actor interface? Uh, I can tell you what happens down at the low level interface very e easily. Because in the case of multiple LODs, we're really just taking the same anim bundle and applying it to the same to each of the LODs. So since the actual control is on the anim bundle, it would work as expected. Uh, the actor interface, um, probably incorrectly, is allows you to specify an LOD, which is a bit of an illusion. Because it doesn't really matter which LOD you specify. Um, yeah, I should probably fix that interface so you don't specify the LOD. But I was just doing that because that's all the other actor interfaces. Uh, the the anim bundle you said gets applied to all LODs every well, frame, or just the one that's currently visible. Does well, you even know about that. Uh, no, the anim bundle is applied to all LODs. Uh -huh. uh, now, only one of them is animating at any given time, okay. but potentially they're all animating. Uh, so the anim bundle is really just a static table of data. It doesn't do any work. I see. It's just the, the character is the one who's responsible for walking through the tree whenever it renders, uh, and asking each frame to get its current animation. And the, and the or actually each joint to get the current animation for the frame. Okay. And the joint does that by querying its associated anim bundle. So the anim bundle kind of has a table of uh, transforms that get applied to the parts of the part bundle. Right, right. Yeah, the anim bundle is conceptually just a repository for joint joint transforms. Okay. And that's why this is a place to put it for a dynamic control because this is just a new kind of a new kind of uh, joint transform. This is one that happens to come from the programmer, yeah. not from a table. But as far as the joint's concerned, it doesn't know the difference. So the CMU error when they were doing that car race down the hill, that was about the timing of when you're going through the park bundle? Yes, yeah, that was because they had a character, I mean, they had a camera parented here. They had a camera under the joint. And um, the character, by optimization purposes, uh, does not actually care calculate its joint animations until it actually gets rendered. Um, that is before it, until it gets traversed in the cold traversal, which is just before the render. Um, and so that means uh, th there's, a, there's a scene graph up here, all sorts of other stuff going on. And at some point during the scene graph traversal, it uh, visits every node, it eventually visits the character node to say, are you ready to draw? And when it does visit the character node, the character at that point uh, asks its joints to go figure out what their position is and update all the uh, joints under here appropriately. And because the camera was inheriting the transform from a joint that was being updated at that point once the traversal had already started, it means the character uh, changed during the uh, traversal. So uh, between the time the traversal started and the time the traversal, traversal ended, the camera had two different transforms. Um, and because I didn't anticipate that in designing the traversal, um, some of the character, some of the scene got animated with the character in one position and some with the character camera in another position. And you got the stutter effect. Um, so yeah, uh, the, sh the short term solution for them was to uh, force the character to update itself before the traversal started. Uh, and that, that has a nice effect anyway, that it means that the camera has a particular animation and known position at the beginning of the frame, which has already been updated by the character, which is what they wanted anyway. Um, okay, I think that's, uh, that's all the theory I can think about. Uh, we did talk about actors before. Should I go about them some more? Or do we feel comfortable with those? Their interface is a little nicer. Um, or should I go back down to the egg files and what the egg file looks like for the uh, various two kinds of models? I don't mind you. I mean, I missed the last class. So I don't mind hearing <laughs> actor stuff again, but everybody else is doing
Any suggestions? Okay. Uh, I'll go over the actor a little bit some more. I think it's kind of good to get a recap um, anyway, because uh, a lot of this stuff is kind of kind of confusing and complicated, and uh, seeing it twice sometimes helps uh, eliminate confusion. Okay, uh, so an actor is a Python object, and it inherits from NedPath, which many of our Python objects do. So if we go back to our, uh, well, originally I had character being the top of the graph, but actually the actor is a different node, it's just a panda node. Um, and typically, the first node under that will be the character. So this is your actor object in Python. Typically, you will import actor and create an actor with, for instance, panda, panda.egg, and you'll give it a dictionary of animations, walk, There's a few other parameters on that constructor, but that's, that's most of it, which is kind of nice. So the thing that's nice about Actor is it does all the nitty gritty stuff of loading the models, finding the animations for you, and controlling the animations, and keeping track of your anim controls, all by name. So the idea is you give it the name of the model file here. It's just one model file, typically for an actor. Um, and then here's a dictionary of many, possibly, many different animations, each of which has a name that you assign. The name may or may not be related to the name of the model, for the animation file, the egg file. Um, but, it, uh, you know, usually it's got some correlation. Uh, and then when you want to play the animation, so you say A equals actor, now we can just say A dot play walk. And this causes the actor to load the animation if it has not been loaded yet, uh, bind the animation to the character, and create an anim control bus, and then take anim control dot play and the character starts walking. Of course, walk sounds like a looping cycle. Maybe you really wanted to say a dot loop. Which, of course, takes the same animation and loops it repeatedly. Um, there is a lot of other things that the actor does behind the scenes. It kind of evolved. Um, in particular, in Toontown, we have a particularly complicated character. First, he's got uh, our tunings are not parented directly to the panda node, they're parented to an LED node. So that we have three. This corresponds to the three different LEDs, uh, far, medium, and close distances. The LED is a special kind of node that has a property that it renders only whatever child is appropriate to the distance from the camera. Um, and there is a special constructor in the actor to specify, I'm actually loading these multiple different models, one for each LED. Um, furthermore, repeated here also. Each character, uh, each LED is itself a composite character in the case of Toontown because we have legs stacked on top of hips, or hips, I'm sorry, hips on top of legs. Um, because we have in the case of Toontown we have mix and match characters. You can uh, sw swap in and out your torso, swap in and out your, le your, your legs, and swap in and out your head. Of course, we all know that. Um, and the way we implement that is we actually have separate characters. There's a character who's just a pair of legs walking around. Um, and it's got one particular joint, which happens to be called joint to hip. And we expose that joint. And so that joint is exposed here. This is becomes, if we looked at the uh, joint hierarchy for the legs, it would look something like this. The joint to hip is here at the top, and we have the knees and the ankles and you know, there's toe joints and stuff like that down here. 
Um, but here's the top joint. That one happens to be exposed here. So every frame, this joint updates this DCS. This act applies a transform to this node, I should say. Uh, and then we have the torso character, which is a, a totally unrelated character, and it's parented to that. So the torso character starts here, the origin is here, is parented to the hips, and it has its own joints with hands and stuff that animate. Um, and similarly for the head, it's stacked up on top of the neck under here. So at the end of the day, we end up with a total of up to nine characters for the, uh, each tune. Uh, but the actor code handles all that transparently for us. So from the point of, the point of view of the actor, it's just one object with one animation. We say actor.play neutral, and it takes a neutral animation and loads it up and it binds it to each of the characters, all, all nine of them, really. Um, and uh, whichever character happens to be visible is the one that actually calculates its, uh, its animation for that frame. So we see the legs playing the neutral animation, the torso similarly playing their own neutral animation, which happens to work well with the leg animation, and the ears are flopping around on the head, which is playing its neutral animation. Um, and the animation is actually applied to one of the models because it happens to be found during the, the at the render traversal. Yes. Is that correct? That's right. As so this is what the scene graph looks like. And as the scene graph is rendered, eventually we come to the tune. Uh, we come to the LED. The LED switches us in one direction. Uh, suppose we go this way. This character is then the one that gets animated. Uh, and uh, this joint gets updated. This character gets animated. This joint gets updated, and so on down. If you look at these joint positions, they won't be updated. Uh, and people have made that mistake before. Um, for instance, in the early days of the battles, battle staging, we would sometimes want to take a pie and turn it to the tune's hand. Well, we tried to do a warp repair to the tune's hand, which we figured was where it should be. But it turns out that LED hadn't been updated in a while, so the joint was some frame from Wilds. Uh, maybe it was in the middle of a jump animation when the last time we saw this joint be animated. So the joint was way somewhere away where it shouldn't be. By the time the character got updated, the joint popped down where it belonged, and the pie was in the wrong place. Um, so so uh, there is a mechanism. There's an actor dot update, which forces the actor to update all of his characters right now. Um, and that's, that's a hack that you can do sometimes if you want to do that. But it's better um, maybe to design your character so you don't need to do work appearance to the joint to hip um, or to the hand or whatever you need to do. But, uh, no. uh, there, there was something you were talking about once, you know, that some of the code that was done early on also in the battle would load up three pies and yeah. parent them three times. And you said that you don't really have to do that. Uh, no, we never really had to do that. Uh, but nobody thought of the instance trick. Um, yeah, I'm running out of space on the board, but suppose we had a character, a joint here for the hand. Yeah. We've really got three joints for the hand if we expose each of the three joints on the hands. And actually, these would be toe joints on my chart, but <laughs> you get the point. It's a hand coming out of his hand. <laughs> right, so we have a lot of code where um, somebody wants to parent a pie to the tune's hand, so he parents three pies. One to this one, one to this one, and one to that one. And that's kind of naive. A better solution would be to create a third joint or a, a new node under here. I'm just running out of space here, but that joint would be an instance of all three of these. So this one, this one node is not a joint, I'm sorry. It's just a regular node, which is instanced repeatedly under this one, this one, and this one. Now, this node has a nice property that it's under all three joints, or under all three hands. So I can pair and apply to this node, and now that one pod shows them in all three hands. So we actually have this node now, and so we have code, some code that parents things to this hand, this joint, uh, this node, and we have some code that creates three pies and parents three pies in. Um, okay. Am I done yet? Mm -hmm. I think I'm done. Okay, thank you guys. Oh. Characters in a nutshell. Now you know everything there is to know. Should I go back? Should I talk about some make files some more? Um, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. The egg file is a very lowest level description of a character. Um, I had a picture on the wall before of the anim bundle and its hypothetical joint hierarchy and the corresponding part bundle and its hypothetical joint hierarchy. Actually, I think they're there around. This is a part bundle, this is the anim bundle. Um, so suppose this is our panda animation, and this is panda walk.
and these correspond to uh, egg files, of course, there's a panda.egg file. Actually, the panda is called panda.egg. I mean, some, sometimes the convention is panda-mod, but it's not in this case. And sometimes it's, it would be panda-0. Uh, a lot of times in our TT models hierarchy, we have uh, like tune-0 for the, uh, the model file. Um, but uh, anyway, the egg file is a normal geometry egg file, like most of our other egg files. It, if you open it up, it has a list of groups, and each group has a list of polygons. Etc. And there can be any arbitrary number of groups and polygons. This is just all the geometry that goes into the panda. Uh, but it also has something distinctive for characters is a hierarchy of joints. And a joint is a special kind of group. And this, in fact, exactly describes this relationship. Um, so if our root joint is called A and we have a joint B and joint C, then the first joint we come across will be joint A in the egg file. And underneath, within that joint, there will be a joint. B and joint C, and so on. And these nest hierarchically like other things. So the joint hierarchy turns into this. The group hierarchy uh, would normally turn into the seam graph. Um, in the case of the character node, the group hierarchy is all collapsed because uh, we assume generally that uh, the only group grouping that's significant in the character is for the joints. Uh, if there are groups up here, it's probably for a modeler's convenience, uh, and we don't really respect it. Uh, there are exceptions, and if you really want to have a group, you can expose it. There are options to do that. But most of the time, we just collapse it. Um, the joint hierarchy is a critical one, and that turns into this joint hier hierarchy here. Um, Asad was asking me earlier today about the transform, because every joint also has a transform, which just specifies a matrix, a 4x4 four four matrix, uh, which should be the initial value of the joint position. Uh, as we know, a joint is really just a, a transform. That's all a joint basically is. It's a transform that changes over time by reading from the animation table. But it has to have some initial value. And so the initial value is what you fill in, in the egg pile. Um, and the initial value is important because the vertices of the egg pile need to be transformed into, into the appropriate space. Uh, if your initial transform is not what it needs to be, um, in, in particular, if it doesn't relate to what your animation is, then your vertices won't be where you expect them to be. Um, and I can, I can talk more about the implications in that in, in a minute. But let me go back to the... Uh, our anim um, yes. Are the uh, is the anim file there all deltas? Is that no, the anim file is absolute values. Okay. It's a good question. Uh, so inside the anim file, we have a no geometry, and we have a structure that starts off with... I think there's a table, there's a bundle in there somewhere, but. It doesn't matter how it starts. The point is, at some point, there is a table. And that co corresponds to your root node. Actually, I, I think it starts with skeleton. By convention, the, the top node is called skeleton. Skeleton, if I can write it. And underneath that is a, a root node. And there would be A. And underneath that, again, So on. Now inside the table, all we have is a list. Actually, there's another group. Um, I, I think there's, there's a lot of red tape in the animation table, but ultimately, there is a table called I. These are components of the matrix. Right. The, the matrix is defined component-wise. Instead of as a single 4 by 4 we store it out component-wise. So there's I, J, K Which are the scale. scale. X, Y, Z are the translation. H, P, and R are the rotation. Okay. And now we have shear, which I think is A, B, and C but you don't see that very often. So there'd be a table I, for instance, which is just all the scale components for that matrix for each frame. And then there'll be a table J, which is all the, the uh, Y scale components, et cetera. And finally, you get X, Y, and Z, et cetera. The reason we do this is um, there's some room for compactness. Typically, an animated joint will only have one or two components that actually animate. Um, X, for, for instance, are sliding around, or typically it's just a heading. Or, or pitch to rotate an elbow or a joint. Um, so we don't need to store the whole 4 by 4 matrix for every frame. We just store one or two components for each frame. Um, 
when the egg file uh, loads, it reads up all these things, actually it still continues to store them uh, component-wise, stores them in a great big uh, and, uh, and a bundle, and keeps it aside. And then when it actually applies, the animation and computes the joint, that's when it actually uh, composes all the uh, components for the animation. Uh, it composes that and applies to a matrix, and applies a matrix to the joint. Um, there's one advantage to deferring the composition is that when we're doing a blending operation, we want to apply scale separately from the other animation, the other components. So it makes it a little bit cheaper to uh, blend animation joints because you can you can compose you can compose component-wise more easily easily than you can compose a matrix uh, b to blend two different animations. Um, okay. So I, have a, I have a question. Those tables there with uh, the I components and J components. Um, is there a value there for every frame of the an animation, or is there something that says this starts at this frame? Every frame of the animation. Okay. Uh, so Sometimes it is optimized where you just... Yes. Yeah. There might be... Okay, th so to answer more correctly, a table may have 0, 1, or uh, n number of frames, where n is the number of frames in the animation. Yeah. So if it has only one frame, that means that frame is just held. So if the, I, if the scale is a constant for this particular animation, then it might have just that one value. It doesn't have to repeat it 22 times. Okay. But if there is more than one, it if it be ever changes, yes, yeah, so if it ever changes, you need to have all of them. Okay. Yeah, and that's just by convention. We could do other tricks too, but uh, that's a convention that we inherited from a long time ago. It's a good question, though. Yeah, if sometimes we have trouble uh, where the old soft to, soft to egg converter would sometimes write out uh, joint B, which has 22 frames, and joint C down here has 25 frames, and the character plays it and does the best it can, but it, it, it's always bad. Um, so that's something to watch out for. Frame rate specified in there somewhere? Too. Yeah, that's yeah. true. That's a good point. There's frame yeah. rate, there's also the uh, order of yeah. rotation. Right, so the, it would specify the frame rate here under each table. Potentially, each table can have a different frame rate, uh, although, although that's true syntactically, I don't think we support that anymore. Nobody ever used it, so we just took out support for it. And we do specify the order that these components are supposed to be applied. Um, so we have 12 different components uh, to compose into a matrix. Uh, there is one standard order in which they're normally all composed, um, but you can uh, change that if you need to. Um, and it depends on what the convenience of the model was. Uh, some modeling packages want to always get out components in a particular order and always recompose them in that same order. Oh, egg opchar. I mentioned that briefly. I should talk about that some more. That is an invaluable tool. We use it. Uh, we depend on it in uh, Toontown um, because, uh, as I said, it can detect uh, joints that aren't used anymore and remove them if needed. If if they're not needed, uh, it can add new joints. It can change the joint hierarchy. It can even, in the case of some some of the uh, bugs in Soft Egg, for instance, we had uh, problems where we weren't getting out the animations properly. But what we fix that. There's an option called dash F, so you get just a totally flat hierarchy out of soft to egg. Um, so even though in, in the soft homage scene there's a, a structural hierarchy of a joint, soft to egg just gets out totally flat and gets a net transform for each joint. Okay, that works. You can play the animation. It does what it's supposed to do. Um, but there are some side effects of doing this. In particular, um, you uh, blending doesn't work so well. Um, also, it's maybe not very efficient because these two joints might actually be slave to each other. They're maybe supposed to be parented to each other. They're both moving the same way, but it no longer is obvious from looking at the scene. So these two joints are both moving in the same transform every frame. And now we end up duplicating this joint calculation. Um, so there's some wasted CPU for that too. Um, also another side effect is the animation doesn't compress very well. Uh, when we use our animation compression technique, it introduces artifacts because these, these joints are now doing very complicated motions. But right? if I look at my toe joint, while I'm doing a walk animation, it's doing some crazy stuff. But if I look at my toe joint in relation to its parent, it's just maybe sw swinging up and down a bit. Um, so that becomes a very complicated animation here. Probably all the components are being used for every joint. And furthermore, when I try to use the uh, Fourier transform to compress it, the Fourier is very complicated and it ends up introducing a lot of artifacts that we didn't want. So having a flat transform is not so great. Agotar can actually look at this animation and figure out which joints are moving together and reparent the hierarchy so it looks more like that again, uh, automatically for you. Um, and that's kind of swell. I've done that a couple of times on some of our, uh, some of our characters that had this done. 
and now we can compress the animations and everything works well. Um, Why was it like flattened? Uh, there, are, there are some strange cases in soft to egg and soft to in particular where we're not quite getting out the uh, component wise transform properly. Uh, so the solution is just to say, well, screw that. Uh, just give me the uh, the net transform, and that oh. seems to work. So really, it's a converter issue, and we're just hacking around it. But hey, converters have issues. What, what, what do you say the compression scheme is we use for the? Uh, when we uh, when we store when we convert the animation table to a BAM file, uh, one of the options on converting an egg animation table to a BAM file is compression, uh, and it can. Uh, basically, it does something like a Fourier transform, which is uh, essentially similar to the JPEG type compression. Uh, and uh, the effect is natural shape motions, like sine waves, sinusoidal animations, are compressed perfectly, or nearly perfectly. And things that are very complicated compress not so perfectly. And they have artifacts uh, similar to what you see in JPEG with ringing. In the case of uh, animation, it looks like twitching. Um, uh, but it does a pretty effective compression ratio, similar to JPEG. We get about 5 to 1 at worst, and maybe 12 or uh, even 20 to 1 at best uh, on the compression ratios. So the compressed BAM file is significantly smaller than it would be otherwise, and we, which is good because otherwise it would be quite large and we have to download all that stuff. Um, almost all of our animations are downloaded and compressed now. Uh, and they're stored compressed in BAM file, but when we load them, the loader uh, decompresses it at load time. And stores it all big in memory. Do we have we don't have any loss lossless compression schemes? Uh, well, there's GZIP. Yeah. And, and I mean that's pretty good. You get about two to one. Yeah. Egg opchar is the one which has the uh, ordering of the the application of the rotations in there. Incorrectly, right? Uh, yes, the new egg, egg opchar that lives in Panda is not correct. Um, um, so we uh, we could in principle start. Uh, discarding ten paper fix and go to the new world order, um, but I'm not ready to do that until uh, we stabilize uh, tune time a little bit more. <laughs> that ten paper fix for five years. <laughs> about five years, yeah. yeah. <laughs> what exactly is ten paper? Where does that? You were asking me yesterday about the order that HP and R applied. Right. Well, actually, we're applying it the wrong order. <laughs> We've always applied it the wrong order. <laughs> uh, Who's to say which one is the right one? Uh, this. this yeah. <laughs> Uh, the problem is role is in the wrong place, and it's, it's a question of what's intuitive. Uh, if it's really based on a, a gun as a metaphor, or a tripod, or right. um, you know, alt right. osmo. Choose which way right. you want to shoot, first you how far. Right. And then you pick role last. Well, we're picking role first. Um, and it's fine as long as you never use role, and we never use role, so that's why <laughs> never use Just get rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> for Mark, occasionally you need to, to use role. Um, and it's funny that we never noticed, because it was for years. We actually inherited that bug from our very first player, which was the Scott Watson era player, the, with the original Aladdin carpet ride. Uh, that was even before my time. And then I wrote the character animation and the smart DCS code on top of that, and I just copied that hyper code from that. And so we, and, and so our DWD era player, which is when they did Hercules and, and uh, uh, Aladdin, uh, second generation Aladdin and the um, Pirates ride, that was had the same same bug. Nobody noticed. And now we finally get the panda, and we got copied the code again. Here it is, same bug. And Mark says, hey, the hipper doesn't seem to be working properly. So we, we put in temp hipper fix, um, which when you enable temp hipper fix, it uh, causes hipper to behave in the proper way. But it breaks all the previous encodings of hipper, okay. including all of our animations. Um, so now, in principle, especially when we get the new soft egg, but even still with the old soft egg, soft egg we could probably do this now. We could turn on temp hipper fix permanently, throw out the old code. Uh, animate, uh, regenerate all the egg files with the proper hippers, regenerate all the BAM files, uh, we have to run some pass over the DNA files to fix the DNAs because they're all stored wrong. Um, we probably have to pass a, patch a database to fix people's furniture and stuff like that. Um, but ultimately we'd be in a new world where everything is in a proper hipper specification. <laughs> but it screws me up because some of the stuff in the caves, like for setting up the cameras and everything like that, it, it Needs the, the proper treatment of role and stuff like that, but then that means when you load up some things, some old files, then it's, it's a little yeah. totally broken. Yeah. Right. Mark, Mark's in a bad place because he needs to cross both worlds, and that's that's pretty unhappy for him. 
have teased me by calling it temp. Temperamental hyperfix. <laughs> okay, I think we're all done with characters. Uh, is my egg description fair enough? Yeah. Um, I did. Is, there's not really a whole lot to say about egg. Okay, great. Now you know all there is to know about characters. <laughs>